Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Hey there, fellow patriots. You're listening to The Kevin Jackson Show on KJRadio.com. I'm your guest host, Liz Matori. Feel free to follow me at Liz Matori, which is L-I-Z-M-A-T-O-R-Y, on Facebook and Twitter. So thank you so much to Kevin for this awesome opportunity. I think I'm going to be regular. I'm going to be your Friday host uh, for the next several Fridays. So definitely looking forward to this amazing opportunity. And I just wanted to give a shout out to Kevin again. Um, and of course, to the listeners. Um, I know that, you know, we have different perspectives, but all the more reason we've got to, you know, speak up for what we believe in. And this is a wonderful opportunity to make sure that we have more diversified voices. Before we get into a lot of the information that has happened over the last week, I wanted to um, remind us about Baltimore. As I had mentioned before, uh, last week I'm in Maryland. Uh, Baltimore is our major city here. And if you want to, you know, see and monitor what's going on in uh, Baltimore, uh, just go to homicides.news.com. BaltimoreSun.com. Um, there is a actual map that you can sort of tally how many homicides happen <laughs> in the city of Baltimore. So, in light of all of this wonderful um, protesting and uh, newfound um, social activism that everyone seems to have identified over the last year and a half, I just want to remind them that we've had a lot of problems, especially in our urban communities and. We're quite frankly sick and tired of business as usual because business as usual gets you to what? 21 homicides in the last 30 days as of today. Um, 19 of them are from shootings. 62 in the last three months. One of those was someone under the age of 18. 56 of those are shootings. 144 in the last six months. And again, that's 130 from, yes, shootings. Three of those shootings were of people of that were under the age of 18. Let's try 2017, which was recorded as the most violent year of recent history in Baltimore. Uh, nine children were killed by gun violence. And uh, in 2017, 91 of them uh, that passed away uh, between the eight, ages of 18 and 25. Let's go to 2016. Only within, you know, the last two years, 2016, uh, there were 318 homicides and eight of those were children. So between 2016 and 17, in the first three months of this year, 2018, if you add eight plus nine plus three, you get 20 children who have been killed by what we actually know as gun violence. And um, they've lost their lives to the actual guns on the street. All of those illegal weapons that are literally dropped in neighborhoods. So what do we do? So we can exterminate each other. We have to be a lot more honest about what's going on. And quite frankly, um, I know I'm sick and tired of it. When I saw firsthand the uh, the degradation of my community in uh, Washington, um, you know, as a, as a an adult, if you will, putting two and two together, as I had mentioned to you in last week, you know, no more government, especially Democrat-led government, will find any of the solutions. If anything, they have, uh, let's say, in Baltimore, they have been in control this whole time. Theodore McKeldin was the last Republican mayor. That was um, 1963 to 1967. And so from 1967 until now, there have only been Democrats who have um, governed, if you will, in the city of Baltimore. I have to put an asterisk on that as well, because one of my mentors is Mayor Kurt Schmoke. He has, is a three-time, uh, three-term mayor of in the 80s and 90s of, uh, of Baltimore. He was also a rather unconventional mayor. He tried a lot of innovative solutions to try to um, attack and thwart um, the violence and the degradation of his actually community. He's actually a, uh, excuse me, a Baltimore native. Um, and, you know, he actually still is is very active in the city and he's doing his part. Um, and I know for a fact, um, if, if anything, I could kind of, you know, put an asterisk on the fact that um, there are some good <laughs> 
Democrats still out there, and I would include him as one of them. So we are going to see a lot of these flex of, again, newfound social justice warriors that have really degraded the actual concept of social justice. Um, as a Howard grad, um, you know, I take social justice and criminal justice reform and, you know, um, civil liberties and civil rights extremely seriously. Um, it is a part of my legacy. It's a part of all of our legacies, if you will. But right now, right here, we have a bastardization of our own, our own history and we need to really identify it for what it is. And I'm talking more about what the progressives are doing, not only to our children, but to our psyche and to our social sort of fabric, um, then they've got to, they've got to stop. And uh, what we can do here on the conservative side is speak up for our principles. Absolutely. But also call these people out, you know, like how many times have you been called a racist or you don't know, or you're ignorant or, you know, all these different things that we could talk about. We're actually going to close out our show on um, your favorite gal, Hillary Clinton. But, um, you know, it's not just one or the other. It's all of these people who, quite frankly, um, they they have a lot of issues on their hands. And um, they don't speak for us. Um, they obviously aren't doing anything um, when it is really needed the most. So, um, you know, I mean, they can continue to do whatever they want, but we know that they're fake and we have to continuously, constantly call them out on their fakeness. If they really, really, truly cared about gun violence, actual gun violence, we wouldn't have had the most violent, um, year in Baltimore, uh, to date, um, in recent history. So, um, as I said, let's start on the facts, let's start on reality instead of the fabrication, instead of the, you know, fabricated events that they want to, you know, coax our young people into thinking that they have this, again, newfound, you know, understanding of the world. These problems have been here for a quite some time. And the idea the I, ones that you have identified are not the real issues. Yes, people have issues. Yes, people are shooting up people. But um, I would argue um, they're all being allowed to shoot and to maim and to kill. I know that's a lot to, to handle right off the bat, but I just wanted to speak my truth. Uh, we'll hit you back in a moment. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177. Or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. Beth Cook Moranville, author of Closer Than Your Breath, A Book of Hope. Hope, that wonderful, wonderful four-letter word that you may feel completely out of. I wrote this book to give you great hope. It's not too late. If fetal position is an all-too-familiar place for you, I understand. If the next 60 seconds are too long, this book is for you. Wherever you are right now, whether you're dealing with divorce or death or sickness, take hope. You are going to make it through this pain. Don't roll your eyes. I've walked this road, and I know it. The best is yet to come. Closer Than Your Breath, a book of hope from author and speaker Beth Cook Moranville can be found on Amazon.com or Kindle.com. For more information, visit CloserThanYourBreath.com or on Facebook at Closer Than Your Breath. Kevin J. 
Jackson Radio Show. And welcome back, fellow patriots. You're listening to The Kevin Jackson Show on KJRadio.com. I'm your guest host, Liz Matori. Feel free to follow me at LizMatori.com, L-I-Z-M-A-T-O-R-Y, on Facebook and Twitter. So yeah, I'm a little upset. I'm a little angry. You can say that. Um, You know, it's just, I just get so irked and or angered by, you know, what is going on in our society. And it's not what they actually want us to think. Case in point, um, as I said, I'm in Maryland. Our capital here is Annapolis. And on Tuesday, I went with a bunch of um, my, actually my friends and fellow Republicans over to Annapolis, the state house, to testify against sanctuary state. Uh, We'll talk about the sanctuary states in a moment. But, you know, if you really want to see how bad society has gotten, please, please, please go to your state house and listen to some of the testimony and the laws that are trying to be, um, you know, passed. Just sit in the Judiciary Committee just for one afternoon. Sit there and kind of hear what laws they're trying to pass. Um, you know, so we were sitting there, you know, waiting our ter- for our turn to testify against sanctuary states because they're trying to obviously um, make Maryland a uh, sanctuary state. Uh, but, you know, we're sitting there and, you know, there are a bunch of people coming in and out. And, um, you know, obviously they're like typical laws, like they want to pass um, automatic expungement or, you know, there's um, issues in reference to, um, you know, women pregnancy when they're you know um, locked up or what have you but one that really really hit my conscience was um, basically there were about seven or eight people who testified to basically for all intents and purposes to legislate fatherhood that's basically what they were asking Um, You know, there were a lot of, um, as I said, issues around violence, and there was even a a delegate who introduced um, a law for, or a bill, um, to to address the the, the violence and the assault on teachers. But this panel really talked about how, um, you know, children in Maryland apparently, allegedly, have really bad anger issues that they bring into schools. And so instead of, you know, addressing the family situation or, you know, identifying the fact that, yes, three three generations of generational poverty have devastated our society and our community, they instead are like, okay, well, we need laws now to teach our young children, especially our young boys, how to deal with their anger. And you know, I'm new to this whole, you know, conservative thing and all, but for me, I personally think that's like literally the definition of a nanny state. I mean, we're at that point now, people. I don't know if you, I mean, I know you know as Kevin Jackson listeners, you know that, but please let your friends know that it's gotten horrendously bad. And again, When you're someone like me who has been involved for quite some time and you see like all these things happening real time and you're like, that's not right. That can't be sustainable. What can we do to fix this? Making laws for fatherhood, literally to basically replace government as father. is just wrong on so many levels. And, you know, why is our first option to go to government to fix this. And I know that there, I mean, I'm not taking away from the activism and the, you know, altruism that a lot of folks have had, but I definitely am worried about, you know, why are we turning to the government to make this work? Why aren't we turning back to ourselves? Why aren't we turning back to, you know, our own personal responsibility? And oh yeah, Why don't we slow down and not have all these children when we don't even know how to take care of ourselves? I know that's a controversial statement, but kid you not, you know, and I know that people are doing way too much 
extracurricular, extracurricular activities that they really aren't taking care of their business. Especially if you're, you know, I remember, um, you know, when I was younger, I can always talk about my dad. He's, he actually grew up in East St. Louis. He was born in East St. Louis and grew up in Jackson, Mississippi when his um, mother passed and then moved back to East St. Louis. And so, you know, he'd always talked about how like, you know, you're always, life is always going to come at you in different ways. And, you know, he was from a community that was, it was, it was a, it was a black community. It was struggling, you know, they had some economy, but it was, you know, unfortunately it's been lost and it's been devastated since. But, you know, he said that he fell, he had fallen in love with his girlfriend or some had, and, um, he had an option. He could have stayed back in East St. Louis, um, but he decided and, and had an opportunity to go to college and, and move to the District of Columbia to come to Howard, and that's the reason why my family's here in, in Washington, in the D.C. area. But, you know, those decisions, those, like, life decisions have been around since the night, since the beginning of time. Um, and when is it and when was it that, you know, we as a community, as a family, as society, as individuals, have given up and sort of left left that possibility behind yeah our answer is yeah when the 60s occurred and we our affiliation from one party to the other um switched and what is that now 60 years of lies and you know manipulation and 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 mistreatment and um mis miseducation have devastated our society to a point where, yeah, now you need laws in order to address anger management issues for, yeah, for young, not only black boys, but also black girls too. Oh, and by the way, you have an inundation of, you know, illegals now that, you know, actually now in this place like Prince George's County, they get their own schools because there's so many of them. I mean, are you kidding me? And oh, by the way, the schools are now degraded and so the people who want to send their children to public school you know they want to take their kids out because they don't want their kids to deal with you know kids who have anger management issues because they have family issues because they might have nutrition issues because they might have prenatal issues they want to take their kids out but oh guess what they can't afford private school because private school is so astronomically expensive so who's left to deal with it the average citizens, ordinary individuals, you and me, everyone else, that whether it's through their pack, taxpayers' dollars or by their lives, we are paying for the problems of our society. What are we going to do about it? We have to be a lot more vigilant, a lot more vocal as conservatives because we are literally the only hope that we have left. So we're going to take another break and we'll hit you back, but we've got a lot of of hard work ahead of us. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Hey there, fellow patriots. You're listening to The Kevin Jackson Show on KJRadio.com. I'm your guest host, Liz Matori. Feel free to follow me at Liz Matori on Facebook and Twitter. So, uh, yeah, if you haven't noticed, progressives really don't want us to progress. All of this, whether it's the statistics that I mentioned about Baltimore or, you know, why and how bad our society is to a point where we're creating laws in order for the government to serve as parents and specifically father. Yeah, all of the stuff that we're seeing, and you know this, but we just have to reiterate it once again, still relates to the election. I'm specifically talking about the iterations that we're seeing, where it's the kids walking out of school. And oh, by the way, who, you remember when you were in school, if you missed a day, you would be in trouble. Like you'd be behind in your work. I 
could not stand missing school. And mind you, I'm a super nerd and maybe you are too, but you know, it took you like a week to get back to whatever the f- you were studying. So you're literally, I think in our area, actually, this is the second time that the kids have walked out. So yeah, we're paying for their education, especially the public school kids. And you know, they're walking out because again, it's a fabricated event. This is ridiculous. Who are these parents? You know, oh, oh, by the way, I think they're the parents of either. I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. They're not the like hippie kids, but they're definitely what the Gen Xers kids. I don't know. Maybe the Gen X kids like didn't have enough like going on when they were kids that now they are like have lost control of their own children. I don't mean to talk about about people's parents, but um, at the end of the day, like if you're allowing your child to walk out of school, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot more things that they could be doing, like learning. They could be learning history. They could be learning physics. They could be learning math. Oh, yeah, by the way, we're slipping on that when it comes to um, math and technology and, and science. Talk about competition. There's a lot more things that children, students need to be focused on in order for them to have a brighter future. But, you know, I digress. So yeah, let's go back to these progressives that don't want us to progress, okay? Um, Yeah, we're talking about, as you know, an election that they never, ever, ever considered to turn out the way that they did. And yeah, we're keeping Hillary for later. But um, yeah, this whole resistance movement, again, I live in the area that they plan these resistance things. Yes, they're around the country, but yeah, Montgomery County, D.C. is the epicenter of it. You know, my congressman, even though he's a congressman, his mission in life is to impeach our president. I mean, they are not hiding their agenda. Their agenda is what they call it. It is to resist. And, you know, the weird thing is that it, it, it they'll, they're willing to do anything. And we're seeing it firsthand. Um, anything that can take away from not only the credibility of our president, but yeah, the, our own credibility as American citizens, the other half of the country that voted for our president own so many people now, even though they didn't vote for him now support him because of the stuff that he's actually doing. He's actually what they say, keeping his promises. Mind you, there's some things that I don't really care for, like the whole elephant tri- um, trophy stuff. I could totally do without that. But at the end of the day, most of the things, especially when it comes to economic sustainability and growth, oh my goodness, that is the one thing that they cannot stand. And how sick and sad is this? The moment that people started getting bonuses and, you know, a thousand dollars of what chump change in their pocket, not chump change in my world, I don't know about yours. Literally, they're turning it up a notch. This is how bad it is. They do not want us to be comfortable, folks. They do do not want America to succeed. If Do we have to go back to, you know, the State of the Union address? Remember that? where they were sitting on their hands every single time. Like they didn't stand up. I think they stayed up, sorry, stood up for one patriot, everybody else, everything else. They couldn't even stand up for themselves. I mean, these people are like out of control and these are just our electeds. We're talking about it seeping down into the psyche of our own children that, you know, the moment that you feel a little comfort, you know, like we've had it rough I mean, relatively speaking, for the last 10 years, you know, and all of that goes back to, you know, this, again, the fabricating of crises. We had the uh, economic downturn, well, two actually, after September 11th, and then after again in 2008, 2009, the uh, mortgage crisis. This generation of folks, I'm included in it, didn't get to, you know, attain the the level of success that we were supposed to, you know, so just case in point, I graduated from college in 2002, right after September 11th. I was in New York. So that was devastating for everyone, particularly the people who live there like myself. So our class, most of us didn't have work when we graduated from college, even at a place like Columbia. 
same thing happened in law school where, you know, I'm part of the lost generation of lawyers. You know, we finished in 2006. A lot of my friends um, went into, um, you know, law, law firms and they were the first, the last ones hired, first ones fired. And still to this day, they never, most of them never achieved law, the practice of law or what have you. So we're not just talking about the the bottom rungs of society, folks. We're talking about most of them. And so the young people, particularly the ones that are, what, under the age of, what, 25, they've been surrounded by le- less than ideal um, economic situations, comparatively speaking. And so they're a lot more susceptible to, you know, radicalization, to be honest. Uh, The next segment, I'll definitely talk more about the actual rules of for radicals. You know a lot about them, but um, I think more of us need to know more about them. But again, if you just go by the fact that we have a little bit more breathing room in our in our families, in our own personal economy, that is a fundamental principle of, of the really the right of the left you know anybody who who is in a capitalist society who doesn't sort of you know lean specifically to the bernie sanders crowd and don't forget like we are so myopic you know bernie sanders is this what democratic socialist he's a socialist he's not democratic he's not a democrat he wasn't even a democrat and he only you know registered as a democrat in order to run in the primary So we're seeing it throughout the whole Democrat Party where they're all being primaried by people who are Marxist leftists. They're not, you know, traditional Democrats anymore. As I said before, the Democrat Party is dead. And I don't know how much more we can handle, to be honest, for people to really realize that. And again, like when we don't have, you know, the, if anything, like, when you have economic sustainability, especially when it comes to, you know, our capitalist principles, people are a lot more comfortable. You know, a lot of these thefts, a lot of the crime, especially in urban and suburban environments, um, are crimes of need, meaning of theft, <clears throat> or crimes of, um, you know, addiction, meaning people are out of work and they're devastated and they, you know, they self-medicate. I mean, we have an opioid crisis, folks. Like, it's not just hip replacement folks that are getting, you know, addicted to opioids. It's the fact that, once again, when our, when you're, when the bottom of the economy falls out, you know, the first ones to go, as they say, are the black folks. We all know that. When the economy gets a, a cold, we get the flu, right? The next chunk are the young folks, the people who are entering into the workplace like I did in the 2000s and the 2010s. And then the next phase is, again, the rest of the family. All of us are connected. And once we've gotten this breathing room that the Republican Party and our president, duly elected president, has given us, oh, guess what? No Democrat voted for this alleviation, if you will. They don't want the Republicans, they don't want the conservatives, they don't want our president to get credit, if you will, for the betterment of society. So they literally are staging, it's going to get worse, they're staging events for people to get uncomfortable and to disrupt the system. Because the whole point, once again, going back to it, this is a part of the resistance movement. Progressives only lie about progress. Moment we have real progress like we're having right now, they are apoplectic. They cannot allow us to be comfortable because their only way that you're able to actually, as Americans, support people like Bernie Sanders and the like and the ilk is when you're uncomfortable and you don't know where to turn, when you give up on our economy and the like. We're going to take a quick break, but um, we'll talk more about it in a moment. Kevin Jackson on the Black Sphere Radio Network. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? 
The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177 or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. to identity politics. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Hey fellow patriots, you're listening to the Kevin Jackson Show on kjradio.com. I'm your guest host, Liz Matori. Please follow me at Liz Matori, which is L-I-Z-M-A-T-O-R-Y. Again, we have to be careful about our young people. Don't forget, the youth have always been manipulated by the left. Um, first time, of course, were the 60s and 70s. I wasn't around for that. Maybe y'all were. Um, and, of course, as we can see now. Um, again, we always assume that everybody's working with the same rules, morals, and values um, that we are. But let's face it, we need to know more about them because... You know, we don't really spend that much time with studying. Maybe you guys have, maybe you haven't. But for me, you know, this whole communist radical stuff technically has been very new. And I have to sort of make sure that I understand what they're dealing with and what we're dealing with because, you know, we have to, all intents and purposes, know our enemy. So what do we do? We go right back to the source. You know Saul Alinsky. I'm not going to give him any more credit than he needs. But, you know, all of it goes back to their own handbook. It's all available online. I mean, everything's available online. You just go look up rules for radicals. You get the full text over there. Don't forget this guy, you know, the, I guess the mentor of your girl Hillary um, wrote this book that I guess they still use to this day. And we have to also remember who they source. Um, Yeah, so let's listen. It says, lest we forget at least an over-the-shoulder acknowledgement to the very first radical from all our legends, mythology, and history, and who is to know where mythology leaves off and history begins, or which is which, the first radical known to man who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively that he at least won his own kingdom, Lucifer. Isn't that crazy? Dude actually referred to Lucifer. And so this guy goes straight to it in his prologue and he says that what the present generation wants is what all generations have always wanted, meaning a sense of what the world and life are and a chance to strive for some sort of order. It keeps going on. The young react to their chaotic world in different ways. Some panic and run, rationalizing that the system is going to collapse anyway of its own rut and corruption. And then he goes on. For the real radical, doing his thing is to do the social thing for and with people. In a world where everything is so interrelated that one feels helpless to know where or how to grab, hold, and act, defeat sets in. For years, there have been people who found society too overwhelming and have withdrawn, concentrated on doing their own thing. And then he goes on to talk about the organizer and how the organizer works inside the system. Effective organization is thwarted by the desire for instant and dramatic change, or as I phrase it, as he phrases it elsewhere, 
the demand for revelation rather than revolution. They confront for confrontation's sake. But we have to remember that men don't like to step abruptly out of their security of familiar experience. They need a bridge to cross from their own experience to a new. A reformation means that masses of people have reached the point of disillusionment with the past ways and values. They're self-defeating and frustrated and hopeless. Now, unfortunately, that just describes half of teenagehood just generally as an adolescent. But if you add not only adolescence to social media, to all of these, again, fabricated events, and the social aspect about cutting class and, you know, mobilizing and taking to the streets, literally, this is what they do. And let's not forget in the Naked Communists, which I had to look up, they distinctly said to take over the schools, to take over the media, to take over at least one of the parties, to, to, to make sure that people question the FBI. All these different things are happening all at once, and it sometimes feels as if it's out of the blue, but it's not out of the blue. It's all by design. This time now, especially after not getting the next eight years, like they wanted eight years of Obama and then they totally planned for the next eight years to be Hillary Clinton. But without those last eight years of whatever the heck they were trying to do, perhaps to destroy our country, destroy our society, dismantle it, I don't know. That was thwarted because we voted for someone that they didn't want. Don't forget, they want to get rid of the Electoral College. Remember, Electoral College protects the diversity, as I said before, of our society. Because we have rural communities that are less populated, but they still have equal footing to a place like New York City and Los Angeles. Kid you not, yeah, between New York City, Los Angeles, and like two other states, Hillary Clinton would have won, but you know and I know for a fact that that's not the rest of the United States. So again, you know, what these people do, they go by any means. Any means that they think in order to whatever goal they have, maybe it is to destroy this country, I don't know, at least to definitely control it absolutely in a very totalitarian manner. These are the ways that they do it. They attack the children. They are literally attacking our children whether it's by the food that they eat, as I said before, communication that they're surrounded by, they're literally short-circuited. I remember one of my friends um, is a coach, um, a high school coach, and she was like, oh my gosh, Liz, like, the kids these days, like, are really, they're, like, underdeveloped. And I remember, you know, talking about that, and it's true, it's like, I mean, I don't have kids yet, but I'm around children, And, um, you know, not necessarily the children I'm around because they have different discipline, but you can observe it. Like, um, I first saw it, like when we were on like the bus in the, in the city, you know, a lot of kids sort of like, you know, they just get on the bus and get on the Metro acting all like whatever they want to act or whatever. And especially around elders, they don't care. There is such a devaluing of community now that, you know, that confusion, that chaos, anyone who wants to take advantage and take over our children, this is the perfect time to do it because they're so disconnected. There's, again, stories out there that says that, you know, social media has literally gotten rid of all forms of actual human interaction. Mind you, that's a kind of extreme case, but, you know, Uh, Ben Sass was talking about how, uh, you know, the connections that we used to have, we used to have seven solid connections. Now we're only down to like two or three. I've seen it in my own personal life. You know, if anything, that's the reason why I enjoy connecting and, you know, building out the party and connecting with other Republicans and conservatives in the state, specifically the Republican women, because I literally have lost most of my connections that I grew up with because of my political affiliation and definitely because of my support of the president. So I do believe that it's better to kind of get offline 
and these kids, kids these days, it's so funny that I feel like a curmudgeon, but you know, they don't interact with each other and it starts at home. You know, how many people, um, some people put their, all their cellular devices into a box while they eat dinner so that they at least have dinner time together. We need togetherness, you know, especially for the children who, you know, have issues at home, even if the kids don't have issues at home. The way that our environment is, it's so impersonal and so in your face that we all have to be more mindful of the children that are in our lives, even if they're not our own birth children or, you know, cousins or or nephews and nieces, we need to be watchful of them because if, again, children, and I say children, I mean anyone really, will be influenced by something, whether it's by, you know, freaking hey man, Lucifer, this guy said, or, you know, radicals or communists or progressives or leftists or even their teachers. Unfortunately, the teachers have drank in the Kool-Aid. If they didn't drink the Kool-Aid, maybe they made the Kool-Aid. We're at that time in our lives, in our society, where we can't even trust our own teachers. Why are teachers encouraging kids to, to, to break out of school? If not they were in control in the first place. We have just got to, got to be careful, guys. And we have to watch our kids and connect with them. He won't stop until he's the top-rated radio talk show host in America. What kind of weird competitive freak are you? This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, fellow patriots. You're listening to The Kevin Jackson Show on KJRadio.com. I'm your guest host, Liz Matori, for the second hour. Thank you so much for hanging in with me. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Facebook at Liz Matori, L-I-Z-M-A-T-O-R-Y. I just wanted to say Thank you, thank you, thank you again to Kevin. Um, As I talked about it before, you know, there are very few people who actually, you know, literally like lift as they climb. Kevin's been doing this for quite some time and he's been, you know, rocking it. And, you know, I'm kind of new to the scene and um, this is kind of a, what, the second iteration, if not third iteration of a career for me. And um, it's just really been wonderful um, to sort of, you know, join you in this journey. And you kind of see like the importance of what we need to do here uh, at this time. We've talked a lot about what the progressives are doing and we know, um, you know, we're kind of, kind of a David in the whole David and Goliath situation, as I said about last week. Uh, But you know, like because we have zero mainstream media and we have nominal connection to the education system now, um, we have to really dig deep and use the tools that we have in our in our power and our might uh, to be able to make a difference. Um, I think internet radio and and you know how um, media has changed on the um, sort of it throughout the atmosphere is quite wonderful and I just really appreciate the opportunity to join you all in this journey. Because we're all a part of this community. You know, I think that, again, a tactic that the left uses is to divide and conquer. I mean, it's, it's really not just the left. It's anyone who is in power. The people who want to keep their power, they want us, you know, they don't want us to unify. But we are really unified, especially in this country. And that's the wonderful thing about the United States. And, and I talk about it a lot. And I think we all should be proud of it. But the American citizen, as you know, is the most powerful citizen ever created in the history of humanity, uh, specifically because of the diversity concept. And and I don't mean the fabricated diversity, but I'm talking about, you know, it literally does not matter what you look like and who you were born to. But when you are a, a, a native born American citizen or you're a naturalized citizen, you literally have the world at your, I'd say this world at your feet, but you know, 
people want to talk about how we are like losing our rank and in, 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 in happiness ranking. I think we went down to 18 or whatever, whatever number that is created to, but you can talk about, you know, what we're able to do as citizens. We are able to petition our government. We're able to vote, you know, we're able to, you know, until they steal that from us as well, you know, we can serve, um, our community. Um, I had mentioned that we went to, um, to, to testify and to pretty much lobby, um, our state house in Maryland. Yeah. And one of, a lot of my friends who, um, are against sanctuary are, um, from China. They're American citizens, but they, um, are originally from, um, China. And, you know, I was talking to them. I was like, oh yeah. So what do you think about this experience? Some of them, it's the first time going to lobby, um, in Annapolis against sanctuary, they're for legal immigration as legal immigrants. And they're like, wow. You know, I was like, oh, would you ever be able to do this in China? And they're like, oh my God, no. <laughs> you know, I think we kind of have taken our power as American citizens for granted. I mean, we really shouldn't get there. You know, we, we really need to pride ourselves and again, be proud of being Americans and preserve it. As you know, I mean, again, new to the game, new to the scene, but that's what it is to be a conservative, right? We are, our whole purpose as conservative is to conserve our republic through those fundamental principles of appreciating life. Yes, and I do believe life begins way before uh, birth, conception. We could talk about that some other time if you want. My um, total kind of transition um, when it comes to my pro-choice background and my pro-life experience um, currently. But um, beyond that, we the importance of family, we talked about that in the previous um, hour where, you know, when we, when we skew away from, you know, the, the sanctity of a family and the importance of fatherhood and motherhood and, again, being responsible for your own sort of reaction and, and opportunities... You know, when we don't have that sort of foundation and core, yeah, we end up having to, you know, create laws in order to help children deal with their, um, their, you know, their conflict resolution and their anger management. I mean, it's really weird to think that, you know, it's so simple, but it might be that simple. Again, going back to the church, going back to your faith, going back to, you know, knowing that you have everything possible that you need, especially as Americans within you. We have a robust economy, though it needs support. We have a system in place, though we need to make sure that we are mindful of it and are and the people who are empowered don't abuse their power. But short of that, you know, our system here um, works and it only works by the strength of the American citizen. So what we're doing here in this new media world is to make sure that we stay educated. We have to remain an educated electorate because if we don't, even though some of people, then we'll talk about later, Hillary thinks that we're ignorant, you know, backwards people. We don't know our, you know, our left from our right. We do actually know what's right and wrong. And that's the funny thing about it. You know, they really try to villainize us. They try to make us feel bad about ourselves, but we know the truth. And, you know, we need to use every single possible tool that we have in place until we don't have it anymore. Continue to share this, you know, continue to get more people to listen to Kevin, Can you know, make sure that we are paying attention and calling them out. You know, we cannot be afraid to speak up for our fundamental principles because, it's about our country. It's about our God. It's about our faith. It's about our community. It's about our family. It's about our individuals. It's about every single thing that does make a difference. And again, we have to speak up way more now than ever before because they are throwing the kitchen sink at us, people. We really, really, really need to work hard. We've been working hard. I know you've been working hard. We need to dig deep because they're literally stealing our country away from us. we got to take a break, but uh, we'll be back in a moment to talk about how we do it. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state 
The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177. Or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. Beth Cook Moranville author of Closer Than Your Breath, A Book of Hope. Hope, that wonderful, wonderful four-letter word that you may feel completely out of. I wrote this book to give you great hope. It's not too late. If fetal position is an all-too-familiar place for you, I understand. If the next 60 seconds are too long, this book is for you. Wherever you are right now, whether you're dealing with divorce or death or sickness, take hope. You are going to make it through this pain. Don't roll your eyes. I've walked this road and I know it. The best is yet to come. Closer Than Your Breath, a book of hope from author and speaker Beth Cook Moranville can be found on Amazon.com or Kindle.com. For more information, visit CloserThanYourBreath.com or on Facebook at Closer Than Your Breath. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Hey fellow patriots, you're listening to the Kevin Jackson Show on KJRadio.com. I'm your guest host, Liz Matori. Please follow me at Liz Matori on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks again for uh, checking in. Might as well talk about the Pennsylvania election. It's whatever. Of course, the Democrat Party is like totally excited. And of course, the media is talking about how the Republicans should be so upset. There are several different things that we also have to be mindful of. Number one, you can only steal elections when they're close, folks. So if you see a 50-50 split when it comes to an election, that means that there was a lot of chicanery going on. Democrats are notorious for stealing things, particularly elections. And uh, case in point, I know it's happening here in Maryland. It's probably happening in your state too. But what they're doing is they're encouraging people to register to vote when they're not eligible to vote. Um, And especially if you do it in huge droves, people aren't usually able to find out about it until too late. That's one issue that we have. And of course, there's good old gerrymandering. Again, Maryland, Pennsylvania, um, North Carolina, and Illinois, I think, are the biggest um, states that have been really gerrymandered um, to to horrible ends. And of course, you know, the Republicans, um, they say, oh, the Republicans do it too. But The interesting thing when the Democrat Party gerrymanders a state, the lines of the gerrymander are a lot more severe because they have to dig into hyper Democrat areas, more so suburban and urban areas, to pull out Democrat votes in order to negate the suburban and and rural votes or the more conservative votes. So this is what happened here in Pennsylvania. Of course, we had a special election. So this is really only a temporary thing until the next election that's in November. So um, I don't know if the Republican Party is going to contest it necessarily. But, um, you know, if you have people who are obviously everybody on the Democrat side is motivated to vote against uh, President Trump. You know, it's a you know, it's a what's it called? Uh, They want to send a message to President Trump that we don't want you as our president. So we're going to go and retaliate and vote for this random dude who's 33 years old. Um, he's not that random, guys. If you look at um, his backstory, now these people, they're all handpicked. This guy is, um, 
you know, 23 years old, as I said, um, he is, um, his father apparently, um, and look at, if you go into the Wikipedia page, of course, it's so funny. They've already said that he's like the elect, like the, the Congress person elect. Apparently he was born in DC. So that's also suspect. But, um, his grandfather, um, was the Democrat, um, majority leader in the Pennsylvania state, um, Senate back in the day under, uh, Robert Carey, right? And one later was the uh, secretary of legislative affairs. So, you know, he's establishment folks, you know, they're trying to make a case about this guy as this young up and coming, you know, progressive, you know, leader, but he's establishment. He's another establishment hack. He's just third generation. Um, so that's that. Also, um, Sacconi, um, is also an establishment Republican. I don't know very much about him because, um, I haven't really been following, um, much attention, but if you look at the district, um, it has been gerrymandered to a point where, again, to make sure that you have more Democrat votes than not in order to, um, make sure that, you know, it's, it's a weighted sort of experience. Um, now, um, I think that, uh, Pennsylvania is allowing for their courts to draw the lines. And again, once, whenever a few people get to choose, always be worried about them being corrupted. You know, how are these judges chosen? Um, are they going to be unbiased? Again, I wish that I ha didn't have to speak so negatively or so, I guess, so uh, critically about the judiciary. But unfortunately, um, you know, there is, you're legislating from the bench, all these different things that I used to hear again as, you know, a former um, Democrat. I used to be like, oh yeah, they're just making it up. You know, like they're not really legislating the, from the bench. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of them are now. Um, I remember this is a little sidebar. So I told you I was a kind of an activist, not a full on activist, but I was involved in, in non part, um, um, nonprofit stuff on the Democrat side for a while. And I worked for an organization called the American Constitution Society when I was in law school. I interned there. I also interned at the ACLU and the Justice Department, all that. So anyway, so, um, Anyway, we, we were um, talking about back about how they planned this all out. Um, so in 2005, we had this um, conference called the Constitution in 2020. So this is again in 2005. They're already having meetings back in 2005 about what they want the Constitution to not only look like, but they purposefully stack the courts with liberal judges. We always focus on the, on the, you know, the Republican side, on the representative side for Congress, president, but they specifically thought that it was important to focus on the governor, I'm sorry, the, the judge's side, because some of them are lifetime appointments. And so how do you, you know, really control precedent and you control law? Um, yes, you pass laws in, you know, our legislative uh, branch, but you, you make sure that it, you know, continues on through the, the judicial system. So, you know, we have to be careful when our, you know, we want to make sure that whoever is redistricting and redrawing these lines, um, are doing it in the most unbiased way and the most nonpartisan way. Is it going to be an issue for judges to redo the lines? I don't know. We have to be mindful. Another thing I want to flag about um, this election is, first of all, it's still 50-50. Like, that's not a Democrat mandate. I don't know why, well, shoot, you all know why that they're trying to, like, make it a big deal. But we on the right, or we, again, right of left, have to be careful about complacency. A lot of y'all uh, voted for the first time in 2016. Um Again, elections happen all the time and what they call these midterm elections, these are what really kind of swings the pendulum to a, another side. Um, traditionally, um, again, this is not a traditional time of uh, our politics, but traditionally the, the elections between the presidentials, t people tend to not vote as much. So when you have low turnout, you, you can win easier. 
you know, so this, um, I think as of, you know, it was like 113,000 people, 113, 813, um, voted for a lamb, and then 113, 186 voted for a Ciccone. Um, yeah, that's the same amount of people. <laughs> so again, we on the le- on the right have to make sure that, you know, vote- voting matters. Um, I know that they are registering, as I said before, people who aren't eligible to vote. We have to be mindful of what they're doing. We really, really have to watch out. Be back in a moment. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Hey, fellow patriots, you're listening to the Kevin Jackson Show on KJRadio.com. I'm your guest host. Liz Matori, please follow me at Liz Matori on Facebook and Twitter. Again, thank you again for connecting with me this time that you're listening. Uh, so, yeah, let's talk about how important it is for our midterms. The only thing I need to tell you is Nancy Pelosi. If the Republicans lose the House, Nancy Pelosi will be our Speaker of the House. That should be enough for any of you who are ever thinking about voting for anyone else to vote for every single Republican everywhere across the country. Um, Yeah, so Nancy Pelosi actually is from Baltimore. When you talk about establishment, again, I am one of the more anti-establishment establishment people you'll probably ever meet. But funny thing is about her, you know, we think that she's from San Francisco. No, she's not. She's from Baltimore. Her dad, Mr. D'Alessandro, was in an elected position since 1926. He was in the House of Delegates. He was mayor of Baltimore for 12 years, from 1947 to 59. He was also a congressman for eight years. Nancy's brother Thomas was also a mayor from 1967 to 71. Yeah. He was one of those first good old boys. These are good old boys. She's not only a good old boy, she's a good old chick. You know, that is a, when you say good old boy, now it's one of those like non-gendered words. When you talk about establishment, talk about Democrat Party establishment, Nancy Pelosi is notorious for being establishment. (laughs) Funny thing about Nancy Pelosi, when I ran in 2016... One of my major supporters at the time um, was my classmate from school. And I remember calling him up. And, you know, fundraising calls are so awkward, right? You're like, oh, can you, you know, like, con- contribute money for, to my campaign and, and et cetera, et cetera. So he actually cut me a check for $1,000. Uh, the first time I ran as actually um, as a state delegate, as a Democrat. But two years later, because I had left, and this was not even by the time I became a Republican, this is when I was running as an independent. He actually was like, no, Liz, I can't support you because I have to have Nancy Pelosi as speaker of the house. And I'm like, dude, we went to school together. I've known you since you were nine years old. I'm not going into, you know, what we know about each other, but at the end of the day, when you grow up with people, like you kind of understand that, you know, dude, you know me. I know you. And so you'd rather have Nancy Pelosi as the Speaker of the House than support your classmate who's running for Congress. I mean, at the end of the day, like, it is what it is. It was kind of the first time where I started to really see the partisanism to whereas, you know, you're not really talking about supporting your friends and your family and all that. But the moment that you leave the Democrat Party, you literally are like persona non grata. You know, so when when you think about the Democrat House and like, you know, not voting for Republicans or voting for Democrats instead because of the confusion and the chaos around what they want to uh, create around our president, always, always remember that the Democrat Party is the older party. It's the establishment. 
you know, I had said that last year, I mean, sorry, last week that, you know, the Republican Party has always been the anti-establishment party. We are the ones that tr- that have always challenged the system. And the system, for the longest time, has been controlled by the Democrats. Another thing that we need to be mindful of is if we allow for the, the House of Representatives, our representative government, to swing to the Democrats again, um, let's not forget the DACA takeover. Do you guys remember, like, this chick... She's not a chick, but Nancy filibustered our our House of Representatives for the purpose of what? For illegal aliens. You know, I understand they're children. They're not children. They're 25 years old now. Um, But, you know, she's never closed shop for any of the rest of us. You know, any of the issues like I talked about in the first hour, you know, the the crime and and the degradation of, you know, our urban communities, she didn't she didn't halt and worry and cry. I mean, do you remember when Chuck Schumer cried? (laughs) Like, I think it was like a year or two ago. Mind mind you, when I get sad, I definitely cry and I get angry. I get I, you know, I get really upset. But grown man, senator of New York. I mean, waterworks, dude. Like, it was so fake, right? Anyway, I digress. The other issue that we got to worry about when if the Democrats take the House is that they are super cronies. You know, a lot of them have been in office my whole life, if not since I was in college or in high school or what have you. And, you know, when you are in that office for so long, you sort of get... A, really comfortable, and B, you end up being beholden to not just your your voters, you're more so beholden to special interest. And when we hear special interest, as you know, as longtime conservatives, but we have to remember, it's not just unions, it's not just teachers, it's also government contractors, it's also, you know, the big guys who create the regulations to protect their hold on, you know, their market share. You know, a lot of the regulations that, you know, the overgrowth of regulations, I think there are like thousands and thousands of regulations that have been brought up in the last eight years during the Obama administration that the Trump administration is trying to get rid of. A lot of these regulations are placed by lobbyists who are representing the people who are already incumbent companies in all the various different industries. And again, a lot of folks, especially the young folks out there, have really, unfortunately, the the capitalism that they're familiar with is crony capitalism. It's not pure capitalism. Mind you, we really haven't had pure capitalism because it's very hard to have pure capitalism, but the corrupted nature of our economics, you know, I articulated in a communist purview, um, you know, kind of bastardized, as said, um, our economy. So the folks that kind of are really disenfranchised and, and disgruntled about how um, how our economy is now, it's really fundamentally, it's not about traditional competition. And if anything, it's about the barriers of entry for the competition that are, again, falsely placed by the incumbents or the people who are already have a bigger market share. They just want to protect their market share that they already have. The other thing that we have to worry about if the Democrats take the House in 2018 is the collusion stuff and the corruption. I mean, guys, like if we didn't have the president of the United States, Donald Trump, Donald J. Trump win in 2016 because we voted for him, we wouldn't have heard about all of the collusion, the actual collusion that the Democrat Party has done, not only to their own donor base. I mean, they basically lied to their own donors, took money that was was given during the primaries and give it gave it to one um, candidate. Again, we're going to talk about, you know, Hillary Clinton later. But that corruption, the collusion, the the lies, the the um the abuse of power, all of that stuff was by the establishment and yes, the the Democrat side of the establishment unapologetically. So if we lose the, the house to Democrats, 
they become the heads of all these committees. They'll be the head of the judiciary. They'll be head of the ways and means. They'll be head of everything. They they won't be investigating themselves, guys. So that is another reason why we have to fight tooth and nail to support good Republican candidates through their primaries all across the state. Again, if you want to run for Congress and you think that you have a good, clean, solid, you know, case to make, run as a Republican. You know, contact me directly if you want to know because I'm doing it myself and here in Maryland. But at the end of the day, we cannot let the Democrats take the House. This guy who might have won in Pennsylvania, that's one guy. Their side wants to destroy us. We have to step up to the plate. If you want to run, as I said, do it. But don't let, don't, don't give up guys. We cannot, you know, act as if this is a done deal. You know, as I said, people like Nancy Pelosi, this is their, their politics technically is like their family business, guys. The Democrat party, their, their business is politics. Their business is corruption. Their business is collusion. Their business is cronyism. It's not about the people anymore for them. And we all know it. So we need to call them out when we can. We need to run against them when we must. And this is the time that we have to take up our proverbial arms, meaning our voices and our votes. We're going to hit you back in another. Uh, we're going to talk about our uh, the leadership styles of Donald Trump. And uh, it should be interesting. Hang tight. Kevin Jackson on the Black Sphere Radio Network. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177 or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. to identity politics. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Hey fellow patriots, you're listening to the Kevin Jackson Show on kjradio.com. My name is Liz Matori. I'm your guest host. Please follow me at Liz Matori on Facebook and Twitter. So I'd love to take a moment to talk about the leadership style of our duly elected president, President Donald J. Trump. So as I had mentioned before, I went to business school, so I discovered most definitely the moment that I started business school, I should have gone there instead of law school, but I digress. Anyway, so the great thing about business is that, particularly in business school, you learn these um, certain terms. The word or the several words that our sort of generation loved to talk about was disruptive technologies or you must pivot or, you know, you know, being an entrepreneur. And it's like, they're really pushing the entrepreneur thing. I'm an entrepreneur myself right now. And, you know, I get it. But when you're in school, you're like, yeah, okay, whatever. So you're sitting there in class, right? And they're talking about, you know, the different industries and which ones are more innovative and not as innovative. Could you not? I remember distinctly the graph, Um, obviously IT and things that don't, that aren't in existence that obviously can be created are the most innovative, but the least innovative industry, if you will, is government, was government until of course we have our president. I know, um, you know, a lot of people are kind of shocked by how he leads, you know, how he, you know, runs the, uh, our government as a business. Everybody knows that 
government is not business, nor should it be. Maybe that's a whole other story. But the pace that he moves is very endemic of an entrepreneur. Like they say that entrepreneurs are either brilliant or crazy or both. Um, And, you know, basically you have to like sort of the challenge is in order to create a business, you have to be able to make a difference. What they call your point of difference. The more points of difference you can identify in your industry, the better. So case in point, um, obviously one of the most disruptive, um, you know, companies in our recent history is Amazon. Amazon has disrupted commerce, how we buy and sell products. Um, It's even disrupting, um, you know, giants like, you know, Walmart and Whole Foods. So what Amazon and Jeff Bezos has done and his team, you basically have identified the different things that consumers want and need, and then you create a system um, to be able to offer something better than your competitors. So totally, like, they totally changed the game astronomically. So the more sort of crazy of an idea it is, the better, hence the word disruption. So that's where you get Donald J. Trump. He was an anti-establishment Though he was establishment, he was a freaking millionaire, right? Um, he was able to compete on a level, sort of create his own lane, if you will. Just like Amazon had created its own lane when it came to commerce, so did Donald Trump. If you think about it, you do your research, you know. Um, he's apparently been thinking about this and been thinking about the economy. And apparently he met with Richard Nixon before he passed away, according to Roger Stone. Um, he, uh, Roger Stone had div- uh, talked to the DCYRs, the, D- the DC Young Republicans a few months ago. And he had said that, you know, Richard Nixon had met Donald Trump and actually they had spoken at length about the economy and government and, you know, geopolitical issues. And so, you know, I think the media sort of paints, not sort of, definitely paints our president as if like a very aloof sort of, he doesn't know what he's doing type of person. But if you think about it, you know, it's not, if you think that he's an idiot, then that means you think that the rest of us are idiots. And again, we're going to save a special, um, you know, place for um, Hillary in there in a moment. But, you know, if you keep that in mind, the concept of like moving at the pace of business, particularly moving at the pace of entrepreneurship, the whole point is to, you know, evaluate the, 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 the lay of the land, look at your competitors, um, Obviously, another thing that is important is your information and making sure that you have enough information in place and be able to kind of, you know, game it out to see what are the different scenarios. And of course, who is the consumer in the situation, but the uh, the the ordinary American citizen it and or the voter. So that's what Donald Trump was able to do. His team around him was able to look at it and himself to see what's missing. The only thing that was majorly missing in our politics at that time was the voice of America. Like there is the voice of America, but literally the voices, the needs, the, the, the wants, the yearnings, the concerns, the, the anxiety of the the ordinary American citizen was not being heard by the dominating parties. And it's not, people always say, oh, the Republicans, don't forget, he disrupted the establishment of the Republicans as well. We always have to remember that. Technically, I always say that our president technically is is our first independent president in recent history. He's a Republican, yes, he switched parties just like I did, over the last four years. So his policies, his his worldview is not going to be as absolute right, but thank God it's not absolute left either. So if you think about, you know, him being, you know, coming from that business framework, coming from the entrepreneurial framework, you know, you're moving, basically you have to keep on moving. And the other word, the catch word that we <laughs> heard all the time in school was, you know, iterate, you know, it has to be an iterative process, meaning you always have to like reinvent yourself over and over and over again until you get it right. You basically, you know, whiteboard it out. 
basically our government, our country is a huge whiteboard to this guy. Meaning, you know, you identify all the different things that you have to sort of like the different, um, you know, variables that you have to be, you have to consider and then put in place the right framework. One of the major things that, um, you know, we also, I wanted to, before I went to the team piece is that his relevance was very timely. If anything, we wouldn't have had a Donald Trump if we didn't have eight years of President Obama. That authenticity, that sort of, you know, I understand him is because, don't forget, our president prior to was a constitutional law professor. Like my congressman now, constitutional law professors tend to speak over people. They're used to only talking to, you know, the height of the height. He, what did he ta- He taught at what? University of Chicago, if you will. Very prestigious, very smart kids who go there. But again, sometimes I even have an issue. I've been told by my mother that sometimes the way that I speak might not be accessible to everyone. I at least acknowledge that. But, you know, people like President Obama and, and you know, Congressman Raskin, they don't care that they're not accessible to people. I do, and I work on it, and I try. You know, so does President Trump. You know, he's been around those sort of, you know, working class folks most of his life, if not all of his life. And so there's this sense of, like, connection that obviously he has with everybody else. So going back to it, you know, when it comes to, you know, team and, you know, making sure that when you, especially when you're going through, you know, change management, when you're going through a big, huge shift and change, you have to make sure that you have the right team in place. As you know, um, you know, Secretary Tillerson lost his job to this week, which was kind of like, kind of big, but at the same time, don't forget, his appointment was also random too. He was the head of ExxonMobil. I'm very skeptical when it comes to big companies as well. It was still an unconventional, you know, um, appointment. In comes Mike Pompeo. He was actually a venture capitalist. He also worked at a major law firm here in, in the District of Columbia. And one huge thing that we have to appreciate, the fact that he has now appointed the first time ever woman, Gina Haspel, to the CIA. I mean, all this history that actually our President Trump has been making, like, if any other person would have appointed a woman, we would have seen it across the board. And we'll talk about, you know, um, tactics in another bit, but we have to appreciate how valuable our, you know, president is and his style of leadership is something that I believe and as you believe we needed this at this time in our history he might not be the most polished individual or he might be and it's just the media that gives him all that flack but at the end of the day his sort of leadership is what was needed it still very much is needed in order to right our ship we got to do what it takes to make this country work again won't stop until he's the top-rated radio talk show host in America. What kind of weird competitive freak are you? This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Hey, fellow patriots. You're listening to The Kevin Jackson Show on KJRadio.com. I'm your guest host, Liz Matori. Please follow me at Liz Matori, that's L-I-Z-M-A-T-O-R-Y, at Facebook and Twitter. So I wanted to kick this last segment off. Um, when it, Let's talk about what it is to be a part of a sanctuary. As I said before, I live in Montgomery County. I'm from D.C., so both D.C. and Montgomery County great are um, the epicenter of the East Coast um, sanctuaries. Uh, Montgomery County, as I said, um, it actually over the last 10 years, 15 years, um, it used to be that the African American community was the largest minority, but we have actually been surpassed by what they consider Latinos. Now, obviously, as you know, 
all Latinos are not illegal and not all illegals are Latinos. But for our case here in Maryland, um, particularly in a place like Montgomery County, we actually have um, elected officials that actively recruit people from their home countries, specifically El Salvador. And um, actually, uh, before I get into it, um, I had um, gone to Mar- uh, you know, Annapolis to to lobby against uh, creating a sanctuary stake like they want to do now. And I actually got to meet this wonderful, if not not that wonderful guy who represented the NAACP. And I was there, you know, kind of taking a breather, talking to one of my friends who is an American of Chinese descent. And he had just asked me, he was like, you know, Liz, like, why don't African Americans appreciate the competition that, you know, illegals place, particularly um, amongst, you know, black people who are, who have less education or didn't graduate high school and have like lower skills. Like there's a direct competition there. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. That's definitely an issue that I personally have. But I always say that the electeds, particularly like the people who are um, of Amer- of African descent, they always talk about racial profiling. So all of a sudden, this guy from N- the NAACP comes up to me. And I had spoken um, before on record about how, as a new conservative, you're just going to make more people like me conservative when you continue to do what you do. And the guy was like, oh, let me tell you about what the conservatives did with El Salvador. And they're the ones who created MS-13 and the 18th Street Gang, which are the main ones that came. They're now transnational terrorist groups, um, according to our sheriffs here. And, um, you know, they're talking about, you know, I Ryan Contra and all the different things that happened in, in Central America, what have you. All of this stuff happened in the 80s. Okay. A lot of the people like to kind of criticize current conservatives by what happened immediately um, in the 80s. And, you know, for us, particularly now, the people who kind of lean libertarian, I know for a fact that we have gone way too far into the interests of other people. But do we need to make sure that we kind of figure out how to rebalance or allow for countries to balance themselves? I would argue El Salvador might not want to because guess what? All of the people are here that they don't want. I mean, it's a really weird thing um, that if you think about it, you know, when President Trump says what he says, some of the stuff is actually true. But I digress. We also, when we're talking about uh, sanctuary situations, states, even any progressive issue, um, we have to be mindful of not using their terminology. They like to have us say undocumented. They're illegal aliens, people. Illegal alien is a legal term by our laws, just like the word immigrant is another separate, different legal term. An immigrant actually has a, you know, purpose, meaning, and and also permission to be here and then go through the legal means in order to create citizenship for themselves, whether it's through, you know, classes, application, there's a waiting line for many different countries across the, of the world. All the more reason the people who are so anti-sanctuary and particularly, you know, the DACA stuff, the undocumented, and then they automatically get citizenship are people who came here by legal means. Technically, it takes 24 years to come here from the Philippines where my mom's from. So if you have to wait in Manila for 24 years to become a citizen, but you can be here in the United States and hang out and chill for 24 years. I mean, how bad of a system is that? I mean, if anything, we need to really make sure that we respect our system specifically for the people who work so hard to follow our laws. A lot of the people who come from other areas, you know, they have come from very corrupt systems. And funnily enough, when the children of some of the undocumented become, you know, legitimized or they are the citizens themselves, they actually register as independents because they see how the Democrat party actually isn't Democrat. They actually, it reminds them of the socialistic societies that they fled from. So it's super funny, something that we need to be mindful of. They purposely are conflating the terms 
so as to confuse and make sure that we kind of forget that all these people are here unlawfully. You know, that's a lot to deal with. And I just wanted to give us more context so that we can speak more to what's going on. Because all of a sudden they're like, oh, you guys are racist. You're hate filled. It's like, it's not even about that at all. It's about the fact that people here in this country encouraged hundreds and thousands, if not millions of people to flood our systems as if we would never pay attention. And now our systems are overran, especially our schools and yes, our, our prison systems and our jailing. You know, a lot of the people who are having issue with um, the undocumented, no, no, just kidding. They're the illegal aliens, especially the gang members and the uh, the uh, unaccompanied minors are law enforcement. You know, the people who give sanctuary like my county, they do not abide by the ICE detainers and they release people before ICE gets there. So they've already, you know, created a crime. They've probably raped someone or, you know, maimed someone or stolen something and they're held in the jails, but some of these places let them go and they constantly, consistently, again, you know, criminalize their communities. And it's really bad. And we got to really, you know, be mindful of the, the effect. I personally think it's really um, paternalism, to be honest. I know a lot of the progressives and stuff think that they can't take care of themselves and we have to protect these poor, innocent people. What happens if they're not innocent? This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177. Or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. Beth Cook Moranville author of Closer Than Your Breath, A Book of Hope. Hope, that wonderful, wonderful four-letter word that you may feel completely out of. I wrote this book to give you great hope. It's not too late. If fetal position is an all-too-familiar place for you, I understand. If the next 60 seconds are too long, this book is for you. Wherever you are right now, whether you're dealing with divorce or death or sickness, take hope. You are going to make it through this pain. Don't roll your eyes. I've walked this road and I know it. The best is yet to come. Closer Than Your Breath, a book of hope from author and speaker Beth Cook Moranville can be found on Amazon.com or Kindle.com. For more information, visit CloserThanYourBreath.com or on Facebook at Closer Than Your Breath. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Hey fellow patriots, you are listening to the Kevin Jackson Show on kjradio.com. I'm your guest host, Liz Matori. Please follow me at Liz Matori on Facebook and Twitter. So there's a topic that I'm not quite familiar with, and that is tariffs. To tariff or not to tariff? That is the question. And oddly enough, now we have Larry Kudlow to help our president and the White House make better economic choices. But yeah, you know, we've heard about tariffs, you know, throughout history, and they've been used, quite frankly, throughout history to help recalibrate our economy throughout the different um, times that have needed, whether it's the beginning 
uh, George Washington used uh, tariffs. Um, we definitely used tariffs during the Civil War um, and several other times. I mean, in the 50s and 60s, and people always forget, you know, our quality of life doesn't just happen overnight and I am very concerned specifically in a place like Baltimore we used to have a very strong steel industry obviously Bethlehem still used to be there thousands of people were employed by them and then the community the, the the area around it was thriving and then they it died and so all the area around it died with it and I had talked about the um, you know the murder rate and the homicide rate in Baltimore you know Baltimore has become a shell of itself and if tariffs can help the growth of a place like Baltimore or Pittsburgh or you know Scranton or all these different places that used to have industry why not why can't we try you know people kind of say oh you know if everything's different automation's different it's like yeah we can also teach children and teach adults even to you know recalibrate their skills and learn robotics and if everything's going to robotics you still have to get people to make said robotics and and control them so if anything you know people will say oh you know free market we can't restrict the free market all right free marketers you tell me how you plan again plan we need a legitimate plan and action items how you dis- are you planning to build out the economy. I get it. You guys like tax cuts. Awesome. So do I. But what about industry? You know for a fact that not everybody's going to be in biotech. You know for a fact that not everybody's going to go to college. What do you do with everybody else? You know, like that's why I'm assuming, you know, our president is considering all the options on the table. Oh, and by the way, there are countries like China Again, going back to it, we assume that everybody is following the same rules, morals, values, principles that we do. Um, Not everybody does. Talk about currency manipulation and, you know, horrible living conditions and working conditions. And, you know, they basically, I've heard that even the steel and, and that comes from China isn't high quality you guys remember those commercials back in uh, the 80s where it's like made in america and everybody had such great pride in what was made in the united states why can't we go back to that is it union stuff let's duke it out let's hash it out is it the fact that unions ask too much or is it the fact that management asks too much i mean again there are hundreds and thousands of millions of people who need better options And everybody is related to everyone else. Um, Again, maybe they don't care. Maybe the average, you know, elite, maybe Hillary and her buddies don't care about what we do for our economy and what we do for our neighbors and our and our cities and even our, you know, rural regions. But I know for a fact and you know for a fact that what we have now is not enough. We need to diversify our economy and if we can go back to in industrial and we can build out that and again build out families and communities and cities and then again that that I thought was a virtuous cycle if anything yeah welfare is not the solution that's our option there's welfare and drugs that's what we're left with you know that's how desperate and dire it seems to be because in yeah in the 90s yes in the 90s you didn't invested out of our economy you allowed for you know multinational corporations to only focus on their what their bottom line is their profit margin and so of course it's going to be a higher profit margin when you know the labor an American labor workforce is too expensive to compete against China and India and even some to an extent other places practically every other place that doesn't have the quality of life that we are used to and that we are custom that we ought to have or maybe that's it maybe you guys don't think that you know Americans should have the quality of life that we have had for now two generations if not three maybe that's the case maybe you don't care I think if anything when you meet you know people who are borderless people they don't care about the success of this country 
We do. We as conservatives, yeah, conservatives care. But the question is, would conservatives, would conservatives now consider something like tariffs? Because I know for a fact that, yeah, what are we willing to compromise on? If people aren't willing to compromise on tariffs, then maybe they don't really care about the growth of our, of our, of the rest of the rungs. Maybe that's true. Maybe they'll just say like, oh, well, you know, I met a guy. Oh my goodness, I forgot to tell you. I met an actual population control person for the first time ever. It was kind of freaky. When I say that, you know, they might not care about the success of all of us. Yeah, there's a bunch of them out there that think that we're overpopulated. and that They don't care how we die off. They either allow us to die off or they're going to kill us off. But there are bunch of people out here that think that there are too many humans on the planet. So maybe that's how they don't have to worry about the economy because maybe, hey, you know, they're, they can be unemployed because they're going to die anyway. We don't want them around. I don't know. Man, we're all going to like the hell in a, what is it? Hell in a handbag? Hell in a basket? We're going straight to wherever that is. Because we're not paying attention to, again, the bigger picture. I would like to. I hope you would like to. I don't want to see all these people out of work. Shoot, I don't want to be all, you know, insecure about this, that, and the other. You know, we're better than that. I thought that we were better than that. And again, the the tensions that we have in our families, in our communities, cross-cultural, what have you, are exacerbated because of economic insecurity. So yeah, people up there in your think tanks and all of that and the, all the people who have, I guess, control the purse strings of our government and, you know, all of the big businesses and even the middle businesses and the, even the smaller businesses, y'all figure it out because that's what you're there for. That's what I thought you were at least. I thought you were out there, you were supposed to be elected to, you know, figure out how much government we're supposed to have and how much we're not so that we can live the lives that we're supposed to live. I thought that's what, how the system was supposed to go. And again, if it, if we're supposed to give up on the system and it's not supposed to be that way, let us know. Let us know, people. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Hey, fellow patriots, you're listening to The Kevin Jackson Show on KJRadio.com. I'm your guest host, Liz Matori. Please follow me at Liz Matori, which is L I Z M A T O R Y, on Facebook and Twitter. So, Hillary, Hillary, darling. Slow down, Chica. Like, I don't understand, man. I tell you what, man. Maybe she just needs to keep on talking because the more she keeps on talking and going and going and going, it just proves the point that we voted for the right person as our president. And secondarily, yeah, we need to vote for more Republicans in order for people like her to get out of the way, man. Like, I don't know why. I mean, weird thing is, yeah, I grew up with Chelsea. I mean, you know, again, like two degrees of separation. We're in a couple classes together. We have mutual friends. Oh my gosh. All of her friends were obviously rightfully very with her, but how dare you say the things that you say? And oh, by the way, it's because she's thought them her whole time, the whole time for the last what, 40 years of her life, 50 years of her life, she has literally thought that the rest of us were scum. We are scum of the earth to her. And she thinks that she would have ever made a good president for us. And not only that, a good woman president? Are you kidding me? Why in the world would you ever say any of those things about your fellow women? Every single person, every single woman who has the audacity to run around saying that they're still with her or that, you know, any, they literally cannot say anything more about 
Dusty Spring, whatever that chick's name is. I really don't care how many girl friends our president had. At the very least, I mean, our own female presidential candidate has the worst concept of of women. She literally thinks that we cannot think for ourselves. Like, she thinks that we, you know, even when we were back in the 50s, for, I wasn't around in the 50s, but, you know, even if you are a homemaker, first of all, the fact that she thinks that home and and building home is a negative you know that's if anything you know the thing that i i really get irked about is that you know people like hillary think that you know staying at home or even even if you were to defer um an opinion to your husband like you're a bad human being or a bad woman for doing that i mean there are a lot of issues and concerns that you talk about and you discuss and sometimes he will defer to you and sometimes you will defer to him and then you know it doesn't mean that either party is you know less of a patriot or less of a citizen or less of a human being because they are a unit oh you want to talk about you know what we do for our men shoot you covered up your own again like I talked about last week your own husband sexual discretions and abuse you covered up for years for decades and you slut shamed all these women and you have the audacity to talk schmack about half of the country or I guess a quarter of the country if you think half the country voted for Donald Trump and then half of them were women I mean are you kidding me like why does she who is who are her handlers Again, when you talk about people being surrounded by yes people or yes men, I guess the Clintons are surrounded by those folks. And the funny thing is, like, I remember when they came to D.C., I don't know if you guys remember, remember, like, the hairdo and, like, the, the, um, the, the headband look, the bangs, you know, before she got, like, the D.C. makeover? She not only got a D.C. makeover for her look, She also acquired all of the people who, yeah, I went to school with, all those power brokers, they are still freaking bankrolling these people. And so, kid you not, I guess, unfortunately, Hillary and and Bill have raised millions and billions of dollars from really suspect people. That's what we should be focusing on. Talk about Haiti, you know, like talking about uranium, like all these things are a lot more important to to focus on than, you know, Hillary not understanding why she lost an election. And oh, by the way, she went over to India to trash talk the United States and a, an actual women, like actual American women, other American women, you that's where you decide to just go off on us. Like, I just... Oh, goodness gracious. I hope I'm not the only person who is like so annoyed and angry and upset about, you know, Hillary. She was our secretary of state. So are you telling me that this whole time you have been thinking this negatively about American women and you want to, again, be the first American woman to be the president of the United States? Like, get over yourself. Get over yourself, Hillary. You're not you're beyond embarrassing yourself now you're embarrassing us now you're embarrassing us on a world stage now you're embarrassing us to like the indian people like you know i'm not even getting to like her you know physical issues because that's not my business but when you're like again like your whole premise resistance movement you you know progressives you you know democrats whatever you want to call yourselves i really don't care all the people who want to make us, you know, deny our president um, his, you know, his election or, you know, you want to, you know, throw him out or you kick him out and you want to resist everything, everything. Are we allowed to resist Hillary? Like, we should be resisting that sort of degradation of hu- of humanity. You know, like, she really does not like poor people, like in the poor people, I mean, the people who don't make millions of dollars, you know, in a day, you know, and it's just really, really irksome 
to know that I don't think she's the only person who thinks the way that she does. Let's think about it. She is just a typical limousine liberal. She just happens to have, you know, um, a platform to speak. That's the reason why I left the Democrat Party in the first place is because you get to meet the most racist people up front. And then they, um, I remember actually Terry Learman, actually, he was the head of the Democrat Party a couple of iterations ago. And I was running around, I was, it was when I was run, uh, running for state delegate and I was running to like several different events a, in a day. And I was running late because I wanted to stop by his fundraiser. And so it was like right at the end and I just wanted to, you know, make an appearance. I wasn't trying to eat his food or whatever, but you know, that jerk said, um, to me, he was like, what do you want? CP time? And I like froze. First of all, even black people don't say that out loud in mixed company. And sometimes most times they're joking, but for a man who is white for all intents and purposes, to say that, oh, what do you want, CP time? Look at who's on CP time. That's just wrong. That's how they speak, though. You know, these people, yes, those people, they, them, whatever, those people over there are so mean. And some of them are evil, especially the way that they perceive the rest of us. They speak. And when, again, what you speak is what you think, and what you think is what you believe. So Hillary literally thinks that anyone who voted for President Trump is an idiot. So that means that all of us are idiots. Oh, guess what? We are not idiots because we obviously voted for the right person. Because Hillary, you were the wrong person. Every single time you open your mouth, you tell us exactly why. Why we voted for the right person, even as you know, unconventional as he is, as Twitter happy as he will ever be, or as how many, you know, big bosomed women he tends to hang out with on his spare time. We don't care. Because at the end of the day, you are way worse than him. Do you understand that? The way that you function, the way that you have functioned, the way that you have abused your time on this planet the way that you have dis, you know gotten your people to destroy evidence all evidence of your wrongdoing out in plain sight oh and by the way you think that we're all can't think for ourselves because we are cisgendered women and we you know have to abide by whatever our male counterparts say who are you and why do you continuously think that you have any sort of relevance, you literally need to hush up. I'm sorry. I know that's harsh to say to someone's mother, but you need to hush up. And now her grandmother. I, I, I feel really bad, but I hate the fact that, you know, we have to still talk about you. You just need to go. Do you realize with every conversation you have now, you are ruining whatever legacy you thought that you had? And maybe that's your point. Maybe you're trying to destroy any sort of potential positive thing you could ever have done for our country, I guess. But it's literally deteriorating. Kevin Jackson on the Black Sphere Radio Network. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177. Or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com.
putting an end to identity politics. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Hey, fellow patriots, you're listening to the Kevin Jackson Show on KJRadio.com. My name is Liz Matori. I'm your guest host. Please follow me at Liz Matori, which is L-I-Z-M-A-T-O-R-Y on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you so much for hanging in with me today. I had a wonderful time. Uh, For this last segment, I wanted to do something a little different. We wanted to talk about, you know, the importance of femininity and masculinity. We have we are, we are continuously seeing sort of this crazy time now that, you know, for me as a woman, I have to identify as a cisgendered woman because I don't have any plans nor have I ever thought of being something else other than what I was born as. You know, again, I do respect and appreciate people who have an individual sort of interest, need, yearning, belief that they want to be or ought to be something else than they weren't born. That's an individual um, liberty coming from a libertarian mindset. I know that a lot of you might have more of a religious sort of, you know, you know, Christian mindset, which I respect as well. But beyond the whole like transgender stuff, I kind of want to think we want to go back to like, okay, aren't there things like women and things like men? And isn't there such a thing as femininity and masculinity? And aren't those things not bad? I mean, you know, I mean, I have a technically what a lower voice for a woman, but look, I'll just tell you this right now. Like I'm attracted to men and I love, kid you not. I tell you what, the way that my life has gone, I'm a lot of times in the driver's seat, you know, whether it's, you know, being a lawyer and being a businesswoman and all that stuff, like, but the moment that I don't have to be in control and I not only can be in the passenger seat, but yes, trust my male counterpart to do not only a good job, but a better job than I, I welcome it. You know, for example, driving. I'm an all right driver, but I love not driving and I love not having to drive. I know, again, it has nothing to do with femininity and masculinity, but like, I love it when a guy like opens a door for me. I actually had to adjust to that. One of my exes, (laughs) so funny, I remember like, we were coming back to my apartment and I was like carrying, we were carrying, um, you know, um, um, stuff from the market. And he literally had to like fight me in order to not only like help me with my bags, but also open the door. And, you know, again, I had already told you, I grew up in a very sort of liberal environment. You know, we were sort of raised to say like, oh yeah, you know, like women have to do everything. You know, we need to do everything all the time, everywhere. And I think, I don't know if it's innate, again, I don't know where it comes from, but I remember there's a certain time growing up, you think one way, but then when you start experiencing life, I don't know when that is. And again, there are people who are a lot more learned and and understand the world a little bit more than me. But for my experience, it was like around your like 20s to mid 20s, you start kind of letting go. And I say that because it's like when you're raised in this environment, you feel as if you have to always fight for stuff. You always have to like kind of like, you know, prove yourself because you were told and maybe there have been times where people have questioned your ability because you're a woman. It's again, so welcoming to know that, you know, it's okay to be taken care of and and, and both sides, you know, I think on the flip side, you know, when the guys, what I've heard is like, you know, it's really hard to be a man because, you know, you're supposed to expect it to be like, you know, really tough all the time. And, you know, sometimes when you're vulnerable, it's, it's a very hard sort of, you know, experience because you've been trained to be one way. Um, again, like, I don't know what any of this is anymore. And I guess maybe that's the point of it. Some of it is, you know, purposefully, you know, confusing folks and, you know, making sure that we, you know, don't understand what's up and what's down and, you know, how to interact with each other. But I do think that we need to, you know, be a lot more mindful of how not only do we like treat each other, but also how, how we expect to sort of be treated, 
you know? I mean, if anything, um, sometimes, I mean, I'm not going to lie, like, I, I, <laughs> I, remember, I remember when I was in law school, you know, there's a certain time where we were joking, we were like, oh yeah, you know, we're going out in the city, in D.C., like, some of my friends refused to tell people that, or tell guys at, at places that they were, that they were in law school because they felt like it was intimidating, and I remember, you know, again, like it's not necessarily, there's something about it. It's something about like, you can be who you are and you can, you know, do the things you can because I don't think you should be restricted on jobs or opportunities based on your gender, race, ethnicity, all that. But is there an issue when a woman kind of like is more educated or has a high paying job and does that has that had an effect on you know male female relationships I don't know I mean again like I'm not talking about homosexual relationships it's a whole nother conversation but technically right now I'm only talking about heterosexual cisgendered people who are in relationships a guy and a girl and a girl and a guy you know it is what it is um but I do think that we are, you know, I think Kevin spoke about it this week, that there's like an attack on maleness. And I also would argue there's also an attack on femaleness as well. You know, I get really irked and I told you I wasn't going to talk about transgenderism, but I am going to anyway, where there's all this stuff about like how like, you know, you know, men have periods and women have, you know, you know, phalluses. And you're like, no, that's not... (laughs) No, like, when can we, where is it written or believed that we absolutely have to positively have to switch genders and switch sexes? I don't understand how that was such a, all of a sudden an, an agenda. Again, if you think that you are identify and you're very uncomfortable in your own skin and all of that, and you want to go through all of that, you know, difficulty and surgery, so be it. But it's so now forced upon us now. And I think that's the problem. I honestly, like if I were, you know, transgender, I would be upset about how much of an agenda my life has become for everybody else. You know, I don't like the fact that, you know, people, it's it's more of a, it's like we have to change everything now. You know, for us to like feel like, oh, you know, heterosexuality is like a bad thing or the fact that, you know, like I love it when, you know, guys open the door for me and I'm like now a horrible person. Like it's just freaking stupid. And I just wish that we would spend a little bit more time with just being ourselves and it's okay for ourselves to be identified as the gender that you were born or that sex that you were born. And then it's okay for you to be like, you know have a softer side or have a soft side. Um, I remember, um, again, right, right when we were all in grad school, um, that's also the same time that women are at the, I guess the beginning of their fertility or in the middle of their fertility. And so you think about, you know, getting married and then when you get married, you want to have children and then you want to have children. You want to actually, you know, mother them and spend more time with them and oh, heaven forbid you want to homeschool them what happens to your career just the same time as you're developing your career and you know you're finishing school and maybe you're finishing grad school it's right at the same time that you're supposed to be developing a family that's sort of why I kind of get upset about the whole like women's right to choose because what happens if the woman chooses to keep the child What happens if the woman chooses to abstain? What happens if the woman chooses to stay at home with her children? What happens when, you know, the woman decides, you know, to marry said guy? You know, we never really talk about the more traditional choices that people, women specifically, might want to make. You know, and then for the guys, like, I've have not yet met a guy who who can provide, if you will, and someone, both of us will eventually have to work, you know, but I don't know. I mean, I've never actually thought about never having to work or not having to work. Just, that's just not how I've thought. I mean, I'm still would write and still would express myself in different ways, but, you know, has our economy shifted a lot because of the different roles that people play you know and a lot of like the stay-at-home 
guys and stay at home dads get a lot of flack for, you know, wanting to, you know, be parents to their children. It's really fascinating if you really break it down. And we could talk about this stuff forever and ever because obviously it's just apparently not going anywhere. Um, But I really appreciated our time together and I guess I will connect with you next week and have a good one, okay? Take care. He won't stop until he's the top-rated radio talk show host in America. What kind of weird competitive freak are you? This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show.